A reading from Micah chapter 5, verses 2 to 5. But you, O Bethlehem of Ephrathah, who are one of the little clans of Judah, from you shall come forth for me one who is to rule in Israel, whose origin is from of old, from ancient days. Therefore he shall give them up until the time when she who is in labor has brought forth. Then the rest of his kindred shall return to the people of Israel, and he shall stand and feed his flock in the strength of the Lord, in the majesty of the name of the Lord his God, and they shall live secure, for now he shall be great to the ends of the earth, and he shall be the one of peace. Welcome to worship. I'm so glad you're here today. We do have a number of things that are happening in the next few days, so I want to uh, briefly uh, go through that with you in the bulletin. Uh, on Wednesday, we have our final Wednesday night service of the season, and this one will be outside. Uh, we begin at 7 o'clock with a Youth Living Nativity, which is always loads of fun, and... Uh, following the Living Nativity, we will have a carol sing right out on the lawn. We'll spread out and we'll sing uh, all, you know, all the favorites because we're not going to be able to sing all of them on Christmas Eve. So that's your opportunity to come and sing together with the church community and sing all the carols you love. Uh, so come and be a part of that. Uh, there'll be snacks out there and it'll be a really nice time uh, together. On Christmas Eve... Um, we have three services, and we really do need you to sign up to come to Christmas Eve. And uh, so what I want to say is sign up, and if you don't get a spot, we need you to not come <laughs> because we've already expanded the number of people we are allowing in the sanctuary because it's Christmas Eve, uh, not by a whole lot, but by some, and then if we have other folks who also show up, we will have more people than we really should be having right now in an indoor space. So we need you to be uh, diligent on signing up and, and if you're coming. The 530 children's service is full at this time, but there is a uh, waiting list in case someone decides they're not gonna come and lets us know we'll, we can uh, allow others in. But we are also doing that 530 service on Zoom. And there's a link right in your bulletin today to watch that on Zoom. So if you don't feel comfortable coming or you don't get a spot, uh, come and join us by Zoom for that service. Uh, at 7.30, uh, we still have some spaces. So sign up if you're coming to 7.30. Uh, at 11 o'clock, we still have some spaces. So sign up if you're coming to 11 o'clock. The 11 o'clock service will be recorded and that service will be available to watch on Christmas Day on YouTube. So just be aware that if you don't get a seat and you wanted to be at the 11, the very next day, on Christmas Day, you'll be able to watch it. So um, that, that's how we're managing Christmas Eve. Uh, I also uh, want to mention that um, today we are... There are, there's information in your pew about the Christmas Joy Offering. This is an offering we take every Christmas, and um, we take it on Christmas Eve, but we also make those envelopes available if you know you won't be here Christmas Eve and you want to respond to that offering today. It is one of four denominational offerings that we support throughout the year here at Trinity. Uh, so if you want to do that, find that and just put it in the offering plate today. Uh, we still need just a few readers for Christmas Eve, so you can still go look and sign up and let me know you can be a reader, and I'll be sending out those parts uh, on um, Monday or Tuesday. Um, the Light Up Trinity starts tonight. Uh, it was a lot of fun being here yesterday, and people were here in different groups uh, decorating their trees, and uh, a few more are finishing up that up this afternoon. So by this evening, you'll be able to come and walk through those Christmas lights, and you have lots of time to do it between now and Christmas and, and after. So, um, you know, come and, and enjoy that with your family through January 1st. Um, I also want to mention that um, after Christmas, uh, we have some exciting things happening in worship here. On December 26th, the day after Christmas, we have one service here at 10 o'clock, and Luke Boltina will be preaching. 
Uh, Luke is a member of Trinity, and he's, he's in his second year of seminary at Princeton. And so um, I invite you to come, uh, especially on the 26th, to support Luke as he is moving towards ministry and to be here to hear uh, his sermon. And also uh, on January 2nd, Reverend Bill Davney will be speaking. So uh, I wanted to make you aware that, you know, it's, it's holiday time and all of that, but we do have guests in the pulpit and really uh, great sermons, uh, you know, to invite you to. Um, I'm so glad that you have joined us for worship today. Thank you. Good morning, everybody. Let's gather around the Advent candles. Today, we give thanks for the light of Christ. Shining in the lives of all God's people. <laughs> With the prophets Isaiah and Jeremiah. We watch and wait for the coming of Christ. Who will bring light and peace to all the world. With John the Baptist, we cry out in the wilderness, prepare the way of the Lord, repent for the kingdom of heaven has come near. With Mary, the mother of Jesus, we rejoice. For the mighty one has done great things for us. How holy is God's name. With Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John, we tell the story of Jesus. Jesus the child of Bethlehem, who came to save us and is coming again in glory. So we sing this side and this side repeating. Light of Jesus, light of Jesus, show the way, show the way, shine in us forever, shine in us forever. This we pray, this we pray. A reading from Luke chapter 1, verses 39 to 55. In those days, Mary set out and went with haste to a Judean town in the hill country, where she entered the house of Zechariah and greeted Elizabeth. When Elizabeth heard Mary's greeting, the child leaped in her womb. And Elizabeth was filled with the Holy Spirit and exclaimed with a loud cry, Blessed are you among women, and blessed is the fruit of your womb. And why has this happened to me, that the mother of my Lord comes to me? For as soon as I heard the sound of your greeting, the child in my womb leaped for joy. And blessed is she who believed that there would be a fulfillment of what was spoken to her by the Lord. And Mary said, my soul magnifies the Lord, and my spirit rejoices in God, my Savior, for he has looked with favor on the lowliness of his servant. Surely, from now on, all generations will call me blessed, for the Mighty One has done great things for me, and holy is his name. His mercy is for those who fear him from generation to generation. 
He has shown strength with his arm. He has scattered the proud in the thoughts of their hearts. He has brought down the powerful from their thrones and lifted up the lowly. He has filled the hungry with good things and sent the rich away empty. He has helped his servant Israel in remembrance of his mercy, according to the promise he made to our ancestors, to Abraham and to his descendants forever. This is the word of the Lord. Let us pray. May the words of my mouth and the meditations of all our hearts be acceptable in your sight, O God, for you are our strength and our redeemer. And may the gospel be more to us than mere words. May the Holy Spirit produce in us strong conviction. Amen. Throughout this season of Advent, we have been focusing on change. We have talked about the changes that are going on all the time, all around us and within us, and how we manage these changes. We have talked about the kinds of changes that were happening in both Old Testament and New Testament times, and the people in Scripture tasked with speaking for God in times of disruption and change. We have heard prophetic words from Isaiah, Jeremiah, Zephaniah, Malachi, and John the Baptist. Their words have given us hope for their speak to us of the constancy of God when things are not constant. Their words have presented us with challenges, for they have invited us to change in fundamental ways how we organize ourselves within communities and societies They have also invited us to change the ways we behave individually toward other people and toward God. Today we turn to one more Old Testament prophet, Micah, and to two surprising prophets in Luke's gospel, namely Elizabeth and Mary, both women, both pregnant, and both empowered by God to speak to the events that were happening in their day, including what was happening in their bodies, and how God was using them for larger purposes than they could have ever dreamed possible. We begin with Micah, who prophesied in the late 8th and early 7th centuries BCE. During this time, both Israel and Judah came under siege as the Assyrians invaded the region. As was often the case, the ancient nation of Israel was caught in the middle of geopolitical changes as great empires rose and fell and as invading armies laid claim to the land they occupied. Micah does not mince words about the disaster to come. The army that has surrounded the capital city has cut off their food supply. They are starving and weakened and the Assyrians will prevail the nation will fall. But what Micah wants the people to hear is that the story of God is not finished when the siege is completed, and their story is not over either. At the height of their fear and frustration, Micah speaks a word of hope that from a little town of Bethlehem, another leader will arise. On the eve of their destruction, Micah describes a time of security and peace where this new leader will assume the role of shepherd, one who can protect them, feed them, and guide them through dangerous paths to safety. Micah's prophecy is a word of resilience, a word that refuses to be trampled. Micah takes the most extreme of external circumstances and resists the very human urge to internalize them. Micah casts a vision beyond the people's immediate circumstance in order that hope might prevail. Within this year's Advent theme, this passage reminds us that whatever changes come, God's promises still hold true. That's what Micah was telling the people. It looks bad. It is bad. There's no denying it. But don't give up on God and on a future beyond this present historical moment. 
those who wait on the Lord will not be disappointed. A promise of a future in the midst of calamity, destruction, and death. A promise of a new beginning when it seemed that all was lost. When I went to the Merriam-Webster Dictionary, I found three distinct meanings of the word promise. The first meaning of promise listed is promise as a declaration of intent. Specifically, a de declaration that someone will do something or refrain from doing something. Wedding vows are a good example of that kind of promise. The vows of citizenship are another. When Micah spoke of God's promise being fulfilled, he was using this sense of the word promise. The prophet spoke of an ancient vow, the covenant between God and God's people, the one that said, you will be my people and I will be your God, and declared that even in the midst of the present circumstances, that promise, that declaration of intent still stood. The second meaning of the word promise in the Merriam-Webster dictionary is not the declaration itself, but the thing that one expects to happen because it was promised. Faithfulness in marriage because you declared, I do. Allegiance to country as a new citizen because you declared, I will. God's ancient covenantal declaration was, I will be your God. And so the promise was that God would not abandon them. And moreover, Micah said, God had gone beyond the original covenant with a new promise. God had promised a savior, a Messiah, who would change the political and social landscape of the nation, much like King David had done a thousand years earlier. But this savior would not be a warrior king like David. This savior would be in the manner of a shepherd. This savior would be a time of bring about a time of justice and peace. Can you imagine the utterance of such a promise on the brink of a siege? Micah not only uttered that promise, he said the promise will come true even if we don't have the foggiest of an idea of how. Can you imagine still holding on to that promise, still waiting for the fulfillment of that promise long after the Assyrian Empire rose and fell and eventually gave way to the Roman Empire? Because that's where the Gospel of Luke takes us, to a time far removed and to two unlikely prophets. Through the lives of two women, Mary and Elizabeth, God's song found a feminine voice and the lowly were lifted up. Through them, a promise to Abraham was kept, a prophet was born to lead the way, and God came to live among us as a child, to see the world through peasant eyes. The hill country of Judea was the last place you would expect to find a prophecy fulfilled or a miracle revealed. It was a rough and stony land, an obstacle to be avoided rather than a shelter to seek out. But Mary did find a shelter there, a safe place to go, a safe person to nurture not only the life she was carrying, but also the internal changes that were happening within her. Elizabeth reassured Mary during this time, saying to her in verse 45, Blessed is she who believed that there would be a fulfillment of what was spoken to her by the Lord. Promise and fulfillment. Mary sings the glory of God's powerful love. We read in Luke 1, 47 to 55, that Mary sings because God has chosen her to carry the Christ child. She sings because God acts with justice and mercy to lift up those who are considered lowly, scatter those who are proud, and feed those who are hungry. Mary sings for all the generations who have hoped and hope even still for God's promise to be fulfilled in their lives. Mary's word goes far beyond what is happening in her own body. There are, these are words of revolution, of profound change, a reversal of what humans expect in regard to power, justice, and salvation. 
just as Micah turned those expectations upside down with the promise of a shepherd king, Mary gives voice to promises that the forgotten and the desperate will be lifted up, the lost found. Which brings me to the third definition of the word promise, according to Merriam-Webster, which is the expectation of something, the ground for believing that something is coming or even possible. Promise in this sense of the word means the potential for something to happen. For example, the new teacher shows great promise in being able to help her students excel. Or medical advances show great promise for the alleviation of chronic illnesses. It is this definition of the word promise that has captured my imagination in this time of disruption and change in which we are currently living. I thought about Mary's story from beginning to end and recognized that when the angel Gabriel first appeared to Mary, everything was potential. Here was a young woman who might be part of God's story of salvation. But what if she hadn't said yes? What if the promise God saw in her had never been realized? I read a poem recently called The Anti-Magnificat, in parentheses, If I Had Been Mary. It was published on the Mennonite website, Leading in Worship. Dear God, thank you for the invitation you so kindly extended, inviting me to become pregnant with the Prince of Peace. <laughs> what an honor to be asked, and I'm so grateful for your confidence in me. The world needs a savior, and it is to your credit that you have remembered your promises. I totally support your endeavors in this regard. <laughs> Circumstances being what they are, I feel constrained to urge you to continue your search. While I am personally enthusiastic about this project, I know that my parents would definitely caution me against overextending myself and taking on too much. I can think of several women in my acquaintance who are better suited for this task. I would be happy to forward their names to you. <laughs> and if I can be entirely candid with you, the long and short of it is, the next few years are very full for me, with my upcoming marriage to Joseph, establishing our new home together, and there is rumor of a census. I just really don't know how I would do justice to the task of raising a newborn king given my busy schedule and uncertain travel plans. <laughs> I am sure you understand. Please accept my apologies. Thank you again for the offer. Give my regards to the angel Gabriel. It was such a pleasure meeting him. <laughs> <laughs> All the best in your godly work. I remain your humble servant, Mary. And from that same website, another poem, this time inviting us into Mary's heart on the night of Jesus' birth. It's called Mary's Christmas Prayer. Lord, you have done great things, and holy is your name. For unto us a child is born, and holy is your name. For you have shown mercy to your handmaid, and holy is your name. From the angel's first appearance, I've waited for this moment, confident in your plan, confident that all generations will call me blessed, confident when Joseph doubted me, when my parents did not understand, when my friends laughed at me and turned the other way, confident in the face of a journey decreed by Rome's power, a journey to this city of David, confident even in my labor pains that you would deliver me. And tonight, I have brought forth my firstborn son. Here he lies in my arms, a tiny baby, beautiful and perfect. A future king, you say, destined for a throne. Here, in this stable, a king, truly you have exalted those of low degree. Nine months ago, the angel came planting words in my heart, the power of the Most High overshadowing me. Tonight, that angel appeared again to shepherds in their fields. In glory, the angel told them of a Savior, of Christ the Lord, born this night. You appear to the shepherds, but it is I who need your counsel. 
Gabriel, come to me again. I must question you. I've called my son Jesus. Jesus, son of the highest, reigning over the house of David forever. Those were your words. But how will, we ta- will he take his throne? Who will recognize him? Joseph and I are ordinary people, and we don't know how to raise a king. This night, we have become parents to such a child as this. The shepherds tell of a star. Will this sign bring help for me? Of all the babies in Bethlehem tonight, this is the one you've destined to bring salvation, and I do not know how this will be accomplished. This child brings peace on earth, but my heart is filled with questions. God, through your tender mercy, calm my fears and guide my feet into this way of peace. I am the handmaid of the Lord. I am the handmaid of the Lord. Let it be with me according to your word. Unlike unlike most women in her circumstances, Mary is not powerless. Indeed, God empowers her to carry God's love into the world. In a world where girls had no voice, Mary became God's yes on earth, her soul and her body proclaiming the greatness of the Lord. Her yes echoed through time, bearing God's bread into a hungry world, bearing light into the darkness. Today, the voices of a Mary and Elizabeth continue to resound. They challenge us to be faithful, to be bold, to be brave to offer God our bodies, our faith, our trust. They remind us that our calling as disciples is to be broken and poured out, to hear the word of God and keep it. Their witness calls us to be open to life, to work for justice, to embrace a future that the world might ridicule, deny, or scorn. Mary and Elizabeth remind us that no matter where we walk, God has been there before us. Their laughter reminds us that God's glory still shines on people and places that the world might ignore, and that sometimes God surprises us. May this Christmas find us open to revolutionary hope. For in a world marked by chaos, pandemic, violence, division, and unrest, God's promises still hold true. In a world that feels out of control, God is still at work inviting each of us to say yes to what God wants to bring to birth in this generation. In a world where we don't dare to assume what 2022 will bring, one thing is certain. God will be there, bringing forth as God always has, love, hope, and possibility. Let hope be born in our humblest, darkest places. Let this be our benediction. Let this be our song. Amen.
as we come to the time of prayer, I invite you to find the thoughts and prayers page uh, in your bulletin. Uh, I do have a couple of prayer concerns that have been handed to me this morning, and I'll, I'll begin with those. Uh, we are praying for the family and friends of Rich, uh, who um, died on December 9th due to complications from Parkinson's disease. Uh, his wife, Fran, was the director of Trinity's preschool in the 1980s. Uh, I also, uh, we're praying for Grace's aunt and Sandy's sister, Mary Beth, uh, in rehab battling diabetes and some effects from COVID. Uh, prayers for renewed physical mobility with the rehab. And we're also praying for uh, Marilyn, a friend of Sandy and Grace's, who is at home with serious mobility and health issues. Uh, on our prayer concerns list, I do want to uh, lift up uh, those who are still recovering, and it will be a long recovery from the tornadoes uh, that happened in the Midwest um, and all the loss from those terrible storms. Uh, and we are continuing to pray for the family and friends of Carla, uh, Marilyn's friend, uh, who was killed in an automobile accident. We are continuing to pray for the family and friends of Bill, uh, a member here, and there will be a memorial service on January 8th. Um, that the information's in your bulletin about that. Uh, we're praying for the family and friends of Edna, Alice's aunt. Uh, and we're continuing to pray for Chi Chi in hospice care and for Mary Alice and for Tracy and others on our prayer list who are in treatment uh, for serious illness. Uh, I do want to lift up a group that I haven't lifted up in a while, and that is uh, the, there's a whole group of names that are folks related to this congregation who are frontline health care workers are working directly uh, on the pandemic. And uh, with the uh, exhaustion that um, that population is already feeling and now the uncertainty uh, with Omicron, uh, we lift them up again today uh, as, um, as we have been on our prayer list. But today I wanted to specifically lift them up. And of course, um, I want to... Um, mark the, the um, sad milestone of 800,000 COVID deaths in the United States. And we pray for all of those who are dealing with those losses. Let us pray. Loving God, as the prophet Mary tells us, you sent Jesus into the world to turn things upside down and right side up. As we celebrate the birth of Jesus, help us to remember the message of Jesus. May his life inspire us to work for justice and fairness. May his humility lead us to bring balance to our living. May his compassion move us to share your love with all people. And may his devotion empower us to live into your kingdom here on earth. Hear our prayers for those we know who are sick or who suffer in any way. Hear our prayers for those who mourn. 800,000 plus lives lost to the pandemic. Recent victims of violence lives lost in natural disasters here and in other places around the world. We have much to mourn. God, heal our hearts. God, as you are in this season birthing love, fill us with kindness and compassion for all people. Give us eyes to search you out in the least likely of places. Fill our lives with love. God, as you are in this season birthing peace, fill our world with all that is green and growing. Heal divisions and move among us in ways that bring peace and justice. Fill our world with peace. God, as you are in this season birthing joy, 
fill this congregation, Trinity Presbyterian Church, with singing and dancing as we serve in your way. Move in the church universal that all may know you as a God of grace, glory, and welcome. Fill your people with joy. God, as you are in this season birthing hope, open us once more to new beginnings and to as many possibilities as there are stars in the sky. We pray all of this in the name and spirit of Jesus, who taught us to pray, saying, Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our debts as we forgive our debtors. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever. Amen. As we come to a moment in worship when we consider our stewardship, and particularly our stewardship to Trinity Presbyterian Church, uh, I want to remind you that there are many ways to respond. You can uh, give through the website. You can uh, send something into the church office. Uh, there's a new text to give option. Um, today we do have ushers who will be passing the plates. Uh, and I, uh, but I also want to let you know that in the back are pledge cards. If you haven't had the opportunity to uh, make a pledge for the coming year, we invite you to do that. And you can also leave um, your offering in the baskets at the back as you leave. Um, and I mostly want to say uh, thank you for your continued strong support of this church and this ministry. Thank you.
thank you for that. Um, I invite you to stand for the singing. We're going to sing hymn 100, and we're going to sing hymn 119. We're not going to sing 110. 100 and 119. Oh. 
Let us pray. Thank you, God, for the gift of music, for melodies and harmonies, for voices of every pitch. Thank you for composers and poets, for instruments and musicians. Thank you for ears to hear and minds to comprehend the gift that was given so long ago. Emmanuel, God with us, be the song we sing each and every day. Let yours be the melody we carry, your song of peace ringing out through everything we say and do. Grace notes in this season of discord. Amen. And now may the grace, mercy, and peace of God, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit be with you this day and forevermore. Amen. <laughs>